let's make a, a start. Um, just a few announcements before we begin. Um, Kids Club returns this week uh, after the half-term break, so it's returning tomorrow night at 6.30. So please do remember that. Sorry? Oh, Thursday night, sorry, yes. So please do pray for that. Yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a week since it's gone, that all thing. That's right, just out of, the, out of their habit. So, yes, Thursday night. Don't be showing up tomorrow night, actually. Yes, Thursday night. So, so glad we've got this in video. But uh, this Sunday also is our uh, Remembrance Day service. So please plan to arrive a little bit earlier, maybe even if you want to be in your, at your seats even for about 5 to 11 or uh, very, very shortly after that, because we're going to begin very promptly. Um, so we're going to have the time of silence uh, at the beginning of our service. So Remembrance Sunday service. Um, let's, before we turn to God's word tonight, let's pray together and let's ask for God's help as we gather together. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks that we can come here tonight, that we can just lift our hearts to you in, in prayer and in praise. Father, we give thanks even we can spend this time around your word. And Lord, your word says that you are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you in truth. And so, Lord, let us give, help us to give thanks to you. Let us call upon your name. And help us, Lord, even to make known your name and your, your deeds among your people. To proclaim even that name and exalt that name. Even by how we live and by just even opportunities that we have to witness. Father, help us even this week uh, for all the activities that are running for, for Kids Club and also for Grief Share as well as it continues to run. Father, we do ask for your help and your blessing for those. And Father, even for the coming services at the weekend. Father, may you be glorified and even in this time of, of remembrance, help us even, Lord, to proclaim and exalt you as well. Father, just help us tonight as we turn to your word once more. And Father, just prepare our hearts even to receive this message. And Lord, through your spirit, Lord, just apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to begin a new series and over the last uh, little while, we looked at some of the Old Testament historical books, but we haven't really looked at any of the prophets. So over the next few weeks, we're going to address that balance a little bit. We're going to look at a minor prophet. Now, before I tell you what it is, when they're called minor prophets, it's not meaning that their message is any less important, but they're called minor rather because of their size. Uh, so compared to prophets like uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, the minor prophets are a little bit, uh, their books are smaller. But while they're small books, they have big lessons to teach us. So the prophet we're going to look at tonight is Habakkuk, or if you're American, Habakkuk, uh, they pronounce it as. Um, or I think in the Hebrew, I think the correct pronunciation is uh, Habakkuk, actually. So uh, hopefully we've got a pronunciation somewhere between the three uh, this evening. So to find the book of Habakkuk, it's probably best to work backwards from the end of the Old Testament. So if you want to even go to... Um, even find Matthew's gospel and then go back into the Old Testament working backwards, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah and then Habakkuk and we'll come across that. So the reason why I want to look at this book particularly now is really because of the things that are happening in our world today and what we're going to see is that some of the questions that often people struggle with in our world today are some of the questions actually that Habakkuk asks. So tonight's going to really be more of an introduction to this book. We're going to really just look at the first four verses of it. But we're going to look at some of the questions that it raises. And uh, we'll look at even just, as I say, some introductory matters really to this book as well. well let's read the first four verses of <coughs> Habakkuk chapter 1. It says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And we'll end our reading there at verse 4. You know, I don't know how you feel when you come to the minor prophets. Maybe if you're doing your Bible reading in a year scheme or over two years, um, when you get to the, the minor prophets, sometimes maybe you, you might find them maybe a little bit hard going. Um, 
maybe it's a struggle sometimes to understand the just the background even behind each of those prophets or or sometimes maybe we can come at them thinking the minor prophets are just all about doom and gloom because often god warns his people through these minor prophets of the coming judgment that's often what he does through these minor prophets he warns them of the judgment unless they repent but the prophets we must remember have something very important to say to us because many of them also speak of the coming of christ as well many of them also point to christ and help us also understand him better but the book of habakkuk is is a small book and as i say just because it's a called a minor prophet it doesn't mean we should overlook it it's a book that is really, really important we study as well. And it does have some really big lessons to teach us because it's dealing with huge issues. Yet this book is a little bit different than some of the other minor prophets. So we see one of these differences straight away when we actually look at the first verse and we're introduced to the writer. So the prophet, who was Habakkuk? And what you'll see is you're not really given any really a lot of information about him so normally in the minor prophets if you take a look at some other minor prophets what you'll see is you get this additional information so let me give you an example of the book of Hosea so the prophet Hosea is introduced by telling us Hosea the son of Beri or other prophets are introduced that way their name and then they're the son of but not here so sometimes the other minor prophets also even give us other information like they might say how a prophet was commissioned or called of God but again that's not featured here. So the book actually tells us very little about the prophet's own life but the focus of the book you see is all about on the message rather than the man and it is a really important message and it's one that almost near we, we dive straight into uh, in verse 2 and that's another thing that there's no um, historical introduction provided. So again, uh, let me use the example of Hosea. If you're to look at Hosea chapter 1 verse 1, you'll see after the introduction to who the prophet is, it says, He prophesied in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and the kings of Judah. So giving us a little bit of an idea of the context behind it. So uh, here that we don't see that, but when we don't see that exact same period, sorry if some of you are having difficulty seeing that there, you know, it makes it, you know, it's not actually hard to work out when Habakkuk prophesied. And we can get a good idea of that because there's lots of clues in the book about when that is. As you read through the book, what you see is there's many references to the state of the land. Um, you'll notice if you glance down through the book, uh, it talks about uh, this group of people called the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans, we know them by another name. They're also known as the Babylonians. So, so these people, it seems, the Babylonians are about to come and invade. That gives us a really big clue about when this book was written. It was likely written during the last days of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, you may remember that King Josiah, you'll have heard of him, he was the king who brought about a great revival in the land. He sought to repair the temple. And when they were repairing the temple, they found the book of the law. And when they found the book of the law, it was read to Josiah, and it con convicted him, and uh, uh, Josiah in turn really convicted the people of their sin. He commanded also that the law be taught again as well. He removed idols from the land, and there was this really great revival in the land. But here was the thing, after Josiah died and his sons and his grandsons began to take the throne, Judah went right back to their old sinful ways. They went back to their old sinful ways. And Habakkuk was let, uh, likely written during the reigns of King Jehoiakim and uh, Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim as well. And that, that's really the, the last final days of the kingdom of Judah. And if you would look, were to look at Second Chronicles 36, you maybe you can take a look at this at home tonight. What you'll see is there's this line in Second Chronicles 36 that says, what they did was evil in the sight of the Lord. So they turned from this period of revival, which had once been in the land, they quickly turned back to their old ways and began to even worship idols as well. And there's this corruption in the land. Now, what you're going to see is some of this is going to come up in our reading even tonight. And you know, 
People today may be concerned about threats from nations like Russia, Palestine, or North Korea. But in Habakkuk and the Israelites' day, they were concerned about the Assyrians and the Babylonians. See, God had used Assyrians to humble the people. He'd used them to come in, and they had humbled the people. But now there was a new and greater threat, the Babylonians, and they were even greater and more powerful than the Assyrians. So here we have Habakkuk really between this period of the Assyrians then the Babylonians. So he's writing in this period. And the land is in a sorry state. We're told in verse 1, this book records the oracle that Habakkuk saw. Now this word oracle is one that's used in a number of places in the Old Testament to, to describe really a prophetic message. But um, some translations have it uh, as a burden. It's a burden that was given to the prophet. And that's a good way to describe it as well. Because you see, as you go through this book, what you see, it's not so much that the prophet's been given um, a pronouncement to go say this to the people, but rather what follows is actually an amazing conversation. And that's another way that this book is different from some of the other minor prophets. It's what people would call um, a QA. and a If you ever go to any conference or anything, they often have a QA and a session where... You know, maybe they'll interview the speaker and there's a, a back and forward going on asking them what do, they, you know, what do they mean by this or questions come in. And here it's the prophet who's asking this series of questions of God. And what you, what you see in the book, really, the structure is really simple. There's complaints and then there's answers from God. A complaint and then an answer from God. And then chapter 3 is a little bit different. And we'll wait till we come to chapter 3 before I tell you about that. But we're going to look at really the first of some of these questions that Habakkuk had to ask of God. So we're going to look firstly really at the, this, this prophet's complaint. And his complaint really concerns two questions. And the first one is, how long? The second is why? But when you think of it, these are questions that have been on the lips of many people throughout the ages. So he asks, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Now, this question, how long, actually tells us a lot about the heart of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, you see, is a man of prayer. And he's been looking around at the state of the land. And the wickedness has been growing. He sees threats emerging from nations all around. And he's cried out to God for help. So he's seen all the things that are going on, or I've seen one, I uh, heard one uh, commentator put it as, he's, he's picked up the local copy of the Jerusalem Times every day and he's despairing at what he's, what he's reading every day. Maybe you feel like a little bit like that when you pick up your local newspaper or switch on the news. But from Habakkuk's point of view, it seemed almost like heaven had fallen silent because the help he sought from God in prayer hasn't yet arrived, it seems. And things aren't getting better. They're actually getting worse. He says in verse 2, I've cried about the violence and, and yet, Lord, will you not save us? A little interesting little side point here. This word violence, you're actually going to find this a number of times in Habakkuk. And you'll actually know the Hebrew word behind it. It's actually Hamas. Hamas is the Hebrew word uh, for violence here. It's a name which we're familiar with, of course, today. But really it's, it's used in the Bible to refer to situations of oppression. And John McKay remarks this word describes malicious action intended to injure the person or property of another. And this word's used, although this is a short book, you'll find it about six times in this book, there's violence in the land, there's violence that he sees coming. And the prophet's troubled by it. But the prophet's looking around and he's, he's struggling. He's a man who's, who's prayed often about this. Lord, how long? He can't understand why God hasn't yet responded to his prayer. Why hasn't he intervened on behalf of his people? But he's also asked something else as he prays. Lord, why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you, why do you idly look at wrong? So why? See what he's doing? He's, he's really, he wonders about God's purpose. He's now questioning God's purpose. He's wondering, Lord, what are you doing here in this situation? Notice the things that he describes that he's saying um, in verse 3, the second part of it as well. So initially he talked about iniquity and wrong in verse 3, but then he builds, it talks about destruction and violence, strife and contention. 
not painting a good picture, is it, of the land around him? So there's this word iniquity can also sometimes be translated as injustice as well. And paired with the word wrong, it's showing us that maybe even there were some who living in Judah who were also abusing their position and power. We see that going on today, don't we, as well in our, in our country of how even there's corruption, uh, the uh, accusations of corruption and power as well and companies and so on as well. So he's picturing here a corrupt society. It's a society filled with acts of aggression, destruction and violence. There's no peace in the land. It's filled with strife. You know, he's painting quite a picture for us, isn't it? But isn't it a picture that we can see in our world today? You know, we can we can identify a lot actually with Habakkuk. And this is one of the reasons I think for as I was looking at the you know, I was thinking of about a minor prophet to speak on, and the book of Habakkuk really stood out to me. And look what else he says in verse four. He says the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. And what does that mean? What what does it mean when it says the law is paralyzed? Well, the law is supposed to be the basis for order in society. And yet, it seems there was no order in this society. Laws were being broken. People were behaving how they liked. And it wasn't, in other words, the law wasn't functioning as, as it should. So it was paralyzed. Just like if, uh, say, a limb was paralyzed, it wouldn't be functioning as the way it should. So that's what really Habakkuk is saying. The law is paralyzed. It's, 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 it's not being effective in, in bringing order in society. It seemed even maybe those in authority weren't enforcing the law as well sin wasn't being restrained and far from it actually verse 4 for the wicked surround the righteous so justice goes forth perverted they surround the righteous in other words the wicked seem to outnumber them they surround them it seems they're in every side whatever way we turn trying to impose their will upon them you know we've had the, the christian institute here just a couple of weeks ago and just even interesting parallels you know we're seeing there even with things that are potentially being um, brought in as well or others are seeking to bring in you know also we see here in this society and whenever you read some of the other prophets or some of the other historical books in the bible you see that the rich were also exploiting the poor and they were getting away with it no one seemed to care the the justice system was corrupt you know as habakkuk saw this he was moved He was moved. He was moved to prayer. He cried out to the Lord. And what was really grieving him was the fact that it seemed to him almost like the Lord was turning a blind eye to it. Verse 3, why do you look idly, look at wrong? It seems as if the Lord was tolerating this. Because things were only increasing. It was getting worse and worse. And he's wondering what God is doing. Now when we think about that question, those questions that Habakkuk has... I wonder when we suffer, have we been ever tempted to cry out as Habakkuk did? Maybe our questions are the same. They're very similar to what he cried out. Lord, why haven't you answered our prayer? Lord, how long am I going to go through this time of sickness or or difficulty? Or or why? Why has this happened to me? Why now? Or, Or why this way? Maybe you've thought that as you've looked at those scenes in the news of um, in recent months and years of Ukraine for example or what's happening in Israel more recently and you're wondering how long can this go on how long or why why is it that these wicked men have been able to do these terrible things do you know these are questions that have been in people's hearts and minds for generations people have always had questions regarding evil and suffering it was there in the days of the the holocaust people wondered why why did that happen it goes even right back to even to the time of the ancient Greeks. There was a philosopher, a man called Epicurus, and he remarked how Christians believe in an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, a God who is good, and yet evil continues to exist. And Epicurus questioned, since God is all-knowing, then surely you must know about evil. And since God is all-powerful, Surely he must be able to stop this evil. So this man, Epicurus, thought, well, well, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he stop evil? But this led this man to jump to a wrong conclusion. Here's what he thought. He thought since evil persisted, it led him to maybe question and say, you know, well, does this mean that there is no God? Or does this mean that 
God is not the type of God that Christians claim. Can you see how today, there's a lot of people in our world today, a little bit like that man, Epicurus, because they say, look at the evil in our world today. Where is God? I was talking to someone else a, um, a week ago about this, and I was, you know, we're remarking, someone said to me about the, the suffering in the world. You know, how can you believe that there's a, a God? And the great irony is that this is a world that's trying to push God out of almost, it seems, everything whether it be schools or whether it be even society as well. And yet when something happens, what's the first thing that people say? Where is God or how could God do this? You know, there's some irony in that, isn't there? And some people are jumping to that same conclusion that that man Epicurus jumped to. They thought, you know, that this, this, the existence of evil somehow proves that there's no God or they, that he's not the type of God that we claim him to be. But Habakkuk is going to wrestle with these big questions. You know, people who aren't Christians in our world today do ask the same thing as this. They fail to see that actually evil and injustice in our world are there as a consequence of sin. God created a world that was good. God created a world that was perfect. And sin entered into that world. They also fail to comprehend and see how God works. How God even can overcome evil as well. How God even can, and even in the case of Christ, a tremendously evil act was committed against him. But yet God used that for great good. Because Christ, as he hung upon the cross, and as he lived, died, and rose again, he paid the price for our sin. You know, these are big questions. And Habakkuk is one who continues to bring these questions to God. But, I want to ask a question of us tonight. And here it is. Was it wrong for Habakkuk to pray this prayer? Was it wrong for him to pray this prayer? And the answer, I feel, is no. It's not wrong for Habakkuk to pray this prayer because, you see, the fact that he was praying in the first place, the fact he was struggling with these things, but the important thing was where did he turn when he faced these things and he turned to God his prayer actually shows Habakkuk's faith because he didn't give up praying notice even in verse 2 it says how long shall I cry for help the, the, you know, the implication in the, is there he's been crying and crying and crying out to God and he's not giving up here is another man who has lost faith he hasn't lost faith he keeps coming to God and also he keeps coming to God because he, he knew that it's only God who knew why these things were happening. He knows that though he didn't have the answer, he knew God was the all-knowing God and he could answer his question. See, though Habakkuk que- asked questions of God, he still continued to trust in him. You see, his prayer reveals a heart of one who... He's a man who's desiring to see God's word being honoured in the land. You can clearly see that as we go through the book as well. He wants to see God honoured in the land. And I'm sure there's been times in each one of our lives where we've wondered, you know, what is God doing in this circumstance? Why has he allowed this to happen? And there's times we may not even know those answers, even this side of glory. We may not know them. We can't fathom the mind of God because his ways are higher than ours. In fact, actually, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 6, verse 10, we see how even the saints in glory uh, ask the Lord how long before he will judge and avenge those who took their lives. Even the saints in glory are actually crying out, Lord, how long is it going to be before you're going to bring the judgment on those who have even uh, committed these terrible acts against them? You know, but we continue to trust in God. Though we may ask, how long am I going to go through this situation? Or, or Lord, why? Though we may not always know the answer to that in this side of eternity, we continue to trust in God. Because he is the one who is on the throne. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is almighty. And so we continue to bring our prayers before him. And so the psalmist says, Psalm 62, verse 5, There's a wonderful little section in the middle of that psalm. And it says this, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. 
God is a refuge for us. Psalm 62, verse 5. Pour out your heart before the Lord. When we do that, it even honours God when we do that. If we're struggling with questions, we need to bring them to God. When you look at the Psalms, isn't that what the psalmist does? This question, how long? You find that in the Psalms as well. You find even the question of why in the Psalms as well. It doesn't mean there's a, they're lacking faith. But it means they're seeking answers from God. Because they recognise he is the only one who has those answers. But even in bringing those questions to him, it's showing how we continue to trust in him. Because here's the thing, we have a God who isn't afraid of our questions. I always remember when I was younger, mum and dad always used to watch on Thursday night, Question Time. It was a show that I was like, why would you watch Question Time? You know. But what I remember in this show is that always there'd be someone sitting in the audience and you know, you'd have these politicians or other figures as well, maybe even some celebrities sometimes, and there's always one who asked, one or two who asked really difficult questions. And of course, there's sometimes, you know, you see the, the MPs, you know, begin to fidget a bit or uh, look a bit panicked, breaking out into a cold sweat. You know, and sometimes, you know, some, in some interviews, people can get flustered if they're asked a big or a hard question. But our God is never going to get flustered. Our God is not intimidated by the big questions. Our God knows those answers. Our God is a great God. And so we trust in him and we continue to trust in him. You know, here's the remarkable thing you see at this book. God isn't afraid of our questions. He's one who can handle our questions. And as we're going to see next week, he answers. Because that's the remarkable thing about this book. This isn't a one-way conversation. Because it's a two-way one. Because God is going to answer and return to Habakkuk but how does God answer well for a change I'm going to finish in a cliffhanger you're going to have to wait the next week to come back or you can watch along online next week or why not even you can read ahead uh, on our little series in this wonderful book of Habakkuk because it is such a relevant book it's a very important book and just because it's a minor prophet please don't skip over the minor prophets okay because they do have big lessons to teach us. So let's pray together before we come together to pray for the needs of our assembly. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the book of Habakkuk, how we can see even these big questions in life, big questions that many people have struggled. They struggled maybe to try and find answers themselves, but Father... What we see is the answers are found in you. That you're the one who knows all things. You're the one who we can trust. You're the one who isn't afraid or intimidated by our questions. But Lord, you are able to answer them. Lord, you're, your ways are higher than ours. And though we don't always understand or know what you're doing, Lord, we, might, we called us to trust in you. And so, Lord, help us as we look at this wonderful book and Lord help us um, even to be encouraged by it as we look at the world and what goes on around us in the world may we see that the world hasn't really changed it's still the same it is the same even because of the sin that's entered in the, into the world and Lord the solution is the same to seek the way of salvation that you have provided and so Lord help us in these coming weeks as we look at this book Help us, Lord, even to apply the lessons to our daily lives. And help us now as we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.